that concludes topical questions. And we'll move on to the next item of business, which is a statement by Michael Russell on the European Union Withdrawal Bill. And the Minister will take questions at the end of his statement. I call on Michael Russell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Twenty years ago today, celebrations were taking place in this city and across the country. The day before, the 11th of September 1997, the people of Scotland had voted overwhelmingly for devolution, for a different Scotland served by a restored Scottish Parliament. Those celebrating that day did not represent one party or one strain of opinion, and the campaign to secure that vote was cross-party and no party. As SNP chief executive at the time, I worked as one of the three campaign directors alongside my Lib Dem and Labour colleagues. We made common cause with many from outside politics who had believed in a better democratic Scotland for many years. And it's in that spirit, presiding officer, that I make this statement today. Like that campaign 20 years ago, this is not a party matter. It concerns all of us who care about the future of this country. Then we joined hands to try and create a better future for Scotland. Today we must show the same unity in defending the parliament in which we sit and its role and duty to serve all the people of this country. In 1997, the proposition put to the people of Scotland was clear. The UK government's white paper, published in advance of the referendum, set out the areas for which it promised the Scottish Parliament will be responsible. They included law and home affairs, the environment, agriculture, fisheries and forestry, higher education and research. Since this Parliament was established, the range of policy matters which are our responsibility has increased. Initial expansions giving this Parliament greater responsibility for transport were followed by the Kalman and Smith processes, which expanded our competence, albeit in a limited way, into areas such as taxation and welfare. This progressive, dynamic development and expansion of devolution has, we believe, been good for this Parliament and good for everyone who lives and works in Scotland. It has made a real difference to people's lives. As the First Minister said yesterday in her speech marking two decades since the devolution referendum, after devolution, we were able to look not just south but all around us, to our fellow European nations and to countries across the globe. And we could contribute our ideas, learn from others, and then put those ideas into practice here in Scotland. Far from narrowing our vision, devolution has widened our horizon. However, the Scottish Parliament's ability to do that, to contribute ideas, to widen horizons, and to make progress for each and every citizen is now under threat. For presiding officer, in the EU withdrawal bill, the UK government proposes that it should, for the first time since 1999, take powers for and to itself in relation to devolved policy areas in Scotland. It proposes to alter permanently the fundamental principle of devolution as, opposed by three as, as approved by three quarters of the Scottish people in that referendum 20 years ago. The principle that says that what is not reserved is devolved. We do not believe that that would be good for the people of Scotland. We don't believe that the hill farmers of Argyll in my constituency would be better served by policy on less favored area support being made in London which such support will never be needed when knowledge of its vital nature is scanty or non-existent. We don't believe that ambitions for cleaner air and a greener Scotland should be undermined by UK ministers who have very different environmental priorities and who have championed deregulation at every opportunity. And we don't believe that the needs of Scottish families in crisis will be better understood by those who have constantly undermined the welfare state. That is why the Legislative Consent Memorandum lodged in this Parliament today in the name of the First Minister indicates that we are not willing to bring forward a Legislative Consent motion at this time. We cannot recommend to this Parliament that it consents to the EU Withdrawal Bill as presently drafted. And although their procedures are slightly different, this is exactly the same position as the Welsh Government, which will today lodge their relevant memorandum in the name of their First Minister. Let me explain some of the detailed reasons for that stance. The present constitutional arrangements in the UK mean that all the UK's legislators, the UK Parliament, just as much as the Scottish Parliament, must act in accordance with EU law. In relation to agriculture, for example, DEFRA has at present no greater power to act incompatibly with EU law than the Scottish Government. The EU Withdrawal Bill would fundamentally alter that position. It would make the UK Parliament and Government the sole successor to the EU. All matters currently decided cooperatively amongst 28 EU member states and governments will be unilaterally decided by only one, the UK government. 
This bill does not provide for a single new decision-making power for any of the devolved legislatures. Everything goes to London, and it is for London to decide what ultimately happens to those powers. This is not a debate about whether we should leave the European Union. The position of this government, and indeed the position of the people of Scotland expressed in last year's referendum is clear on that matter. We don't want to leave. This bill is not an opportunity to veto Brexit. Such a legal power does not exist. And moreover, we've frequently made it clear that despite our wish to maintain EU membership, we recognize our obligation to prepare Scotland as best we can for what might transpire. Indeed, Brexit is going to be such a dramatic, damaging upheaval to the UK's legal systems and to our laws, that it's imperative that we actually do everything we can to prepare responsibly for the consequences of EU withdrawal. But certain choices in the bill, such as ending the effect of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, will make this process even more damaging than it needs to be. The Law Society of Scotland warned last week, and I quote, that the UK government should reconsider the removal of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and take stock of concerns which are held by many about the potential for erosion of human rights that may occur. So it's already clear that the governments of these islands have a lot of work to do to try and make sure that some stability and some continuity can be achieved on exit day. And they will have to work together if that is to be done most effectively. This bill makes that much more difficult, not least because the EU withdrawal bill appears to represent a deliberate decision by the UK government to use the process of Brexit as a cover for taking powers in areas of policy which are clearly within the responsibility of this parliament. Let me be entirely clear about this. It is not a logical or essential part of any withdrawal bill that new limitations are placed on the Scottish Parliament's powers, on the National Assembly for Wales's powers, or on the powers of the Northern Ireland Assembly. But that is what the bill does. Clause 11 of the EU withdrawal bill contains a new limitation on devolved competence of extraordinary scope. While the bill lifts from the UK government and parliament the requirement they are currently under to comply with EU law, Clause 11 would impose on the Scottish Parliament a new limitation tied to EU law as it happens to exist at the date of withdrawal. In areas of Scottish devolved responsibility vital to the success of our country, such as agriculture, the environment, fisheries, forestry, research or justice cooperation, the Scottish Parliament will have no say over what comes back from the EU on withdrawal or what is done with these important policy areas afterwards. Let me give another example, one I've taken directly from the House of Commons briefing paper on this bill. They use the common agricultural policy to illustrate what this approach would mean for this Parliament. It is an important part of the law on agriculture, a devolved matter, the report notes, but not one which devolved ministers will be able to amend. It continues, if the UK left the EU and did not legislate to the contrary, agriculture would fall within the competence of the Scottish Parliament. But, notes a report, while this can be changed for England or for the UK by the UK Parliament, devolved legislatures and ministers will not have the power to modify the type of EU law that makes up the cap. The system of farming subsidies as has been developed over the last 18 years to meet particular Scottish need is only one example. There are many other areas of present devolved competence that would be put beyond the powers of this Parliament. The high standards of environmental protection the EU has given us, our approach to food standards, the protection of our unique food and drink products, the operation of family law across national boundaries, the recognition of qualifications in our health prof professions. It's a long list, consisting over 100 areas where EU competencies intersect with our competencies. Yet the damage caused to the devolution settlement by Clause 11 wouldn't end when the process of EU withdrawal ends. As I've indicated, it would be a permanent change in the way that the Parliament's legislative competence is assessed. The UK government also wants the inclusion of Clause 11 in order to ensure that it can impose UK-wide frameworks following Brexit, and then in some cases trade off Scottish rights, privileges and protections in lowest common denominator trade talks. Agriculture and fishing are particularly at risk from that approach. Now, last December, we set out in Scotland's place in Europe our clear acceptance that there will be the need for some common approaches across the UK to some matters when the UK withdraws from the EU. But as we and the Welsh Government have made repeatedly clear, these common approaches, the areas they cover and the way they operate, must be agreed and not imposed. However, with Clause 11 in place, agreement could never be reached, since the price the UK Government demands for an agreement would be, in each case, the effective reservation of the matter, 
putting it and the terms and operation of any framework beyond the powers of this parliament. The UK government's approach isn't about UK frameworks. It's about UK government frameworks, decided on, operated by, and controlled within the UK government. But returning powers to the Scottish Parliament along the lines of the devolution settlement set out in the Scotland Act 1998 would not prevent the agreement of such frameworks. In fact, it would enable that agreement because there are existing mechanisms for the two governments to agree a common or coordinated approach. For example, legislation in both parliaments or in the UK Parliament with our consent, memoranda of understanding, concordats, and the administrative agreement of common goals. All of these existing mechanisms are based on the existing, well-understood principles of devolution. Regrettably, this bill and its approach to UK-wide frameworks suggests a fundamental shift in the approach of the UK government to such relations with the devolved nations. And again, let me quote from the House of Commons' own briefing paper. For the devolved nations, it warns Brexit will not bring back control. The retention of common frameworks, the report says, could be seen as an effective centralization of power. Power should be devolved according to the current settlement. It should be divided between the parliaments in accordance with the principles set out in the devolution statutes and, incidentally, the strident promises of the Leave campaign. Now, the Welsh Government have made in their recent publication, Securing Wales's Future, some interesting suggestions about decision-making frameworks at the European level. These should replicate the co-decision-making presently seen at EU level, with the four nations of the UK being equal partners in that process. We are keen to explore those ideas. But whatever the outcome, there must be a collaborative, not a divisive approach to these matters if there is any prospect of success. So, presiding officer, the government stands ready to negotiate and agree any common approach with the UK government and the other nations of the UK which proves necessary. Our only condition is that the UK government observes constitutional due process and enters into those discussions on the basis of respect for the founding principles of devolution as endorsed by the Scottish people in 1997. Unfortunately, they don't seem to wish to do so. And equally unfortunately, the bill is also problematic in other areas which must also be changed. For example, the bill gives UK ministers and Scottish ministers powers to correct deficiencies in law caused by EU withdrawal, the so-called Henry VIII powers. Henry VIII was, of course, never a king of Scotland. But he did invade the country in the campaign now known as the rough wooing. It might not be entirely unfair to use the same term about the UK government now. The version of these powers given to the Scottish ministers is compared with the one given to UK ministers, limited in its scope and application. That is no bad thing in principle, except that an entire category of the laws covered by the bill, directly applicable EU instruments, are given to the UK government alone to correct. This includes directly applicable EU laws in policy areas which are the responsibility of the Parliament. That's not just a technical point. These pieces of legislation include significant items. This means that the UK government would have the unilateral power by delegated legislation to change laws in areas of policy which are the responsibility of this Parliament without any reference either to this Parliament or to the Scottish Government which is accountable to it. This suggests an approach to EU withdrawal designed not only without the appropriate respect for devolution, but one which wittingly or unwittingly subverts it. The only appropriate way to divide powers between the governments is this. Powers in relation to policy areas which are devolved must be for devolved ministers and devolved legislatures. Thereafter, there will be space, time, and I say willingness to agree cooperation over the shared use of these powers in a way which respected the responsibility of this parliament to hold to account those who make decisions in devolved areas. Our position on these powers in the bill is therefore the same as our position on agreeing common approaches across the UK. We recognise the need for some way of making the current body of EU law workable after Brexit. We have as much an interest in that as the UK government does. We stand ready to use such powers in order, so far as we can, to promote stability following the process of withdrawal. But the approach taken by the UK government to the bill is preventing this necessary in fact, essential cooperation and coordination. Now, of course, we also agree with the opposition parties that powers this broad will require greater scrutiny from this parliament. We therefore commit to working with this parliament and with its committees to agree a set of principles and a process which will ensure that the instruments made under this bill receive the appropriate scrutiny. I look forward to this parliament's scrutiny of the withdrawal bill and of the legislative consent memorandum the First Minister has lodged today. The Finance and Constitution Committee, the Delegated Powers Committee and members across the Chamber will have a strong role to play in this 
since it will affect the powers and policies we all want to be used to improve the lives of our constituents. I also look forward to giving evidence to these committees and to making sure that the public understands exactly what is proposed, you, you, the proposed EU withdrawal should mean for the Scottish Parliament and more importantly in their daily lives from Shetland to Stranraer, from Eoligary to Eymouth. Presiding officer, the First Ministers of Scotland and Wales made all of this clear to the UK government when the bill was first published. And that built on extensive engagement in the two weeks before, when we were finally given an opportunity to see, but not to change, what was proposed. Thereafter, in our meetings and phone calls with the First Secretary of State, the Secretary of State for Exiting the EU, and the Secretary of State for Scotland, the Deputy First Minister and I have explained in detail the consequences of the bill's approach for the devolution settlement. We have sought to establish a shared understanding of these issues and to build a way forward that allows both governments to proceed to the essential work of discussing common frameworks and the programme of corrections to our laws that will be necessary. We have explained that it is their unnecessary policy choices set out in this bill that have hindered progress. Therefore, the Scottish Government can, still cannot recommend that Parliament gives consent to this bill. and We've set out the reasons in detail in the memorandum. We've also been clear about what we expect and require the consequence of withholding consent to be, namely that the UK government must make the necessary changes to the EU withdrawal bill. Of course, the UK government has contended that their proposals are the only ones that will avoid the chaos which would arise if no frameworks or legislative structures are in place on Brexit Day. That will not happen. We will ensure that it does not happen. If the UK government is not prepared to make the appropriate amendments, this government will consider as the Welsh Government has confirmed, it is also considering the options available for rapid legislation in this Parliament to allow us to prepare devolved laws for the shock of Brexit. That route is not our first choice, however, because there's a better way forward still available. As the two First Ministers announced after meeting in Edinburgh last month, the Welsh Government and the Scottish Government will publish a set of suggested amendments to the Bill, which would, if made, if made turn the Bill into one we could recommend to the Parliament. These amendments will remove the unnecessary new limits on devolved competence from the bill and rearrange the regulation making powers so they properly respect the well-established principles of devolution and the scheme in the Scotland Act 1998 and subsequent Scotland Acts, as well as ensuring that the Scottish and Welsh parliaments have the appropriate role in holding to account their governments as they make the decisions required to prepare the UK's legal system for EU withdrawal. We therefore stand ready to work with all parliamentarians in all the parliaments to bring forward and seek to have accepted these amendments. Presiding officer, the issues I've outlined today and which are given in much more detail in the memorandum are not arcane constitutional points. We're talking about the role and duty of these parliaments to help improve the life of the citizens they serve. We're talking about the real difference this parliament has made and can make and a diminution of that ability. The current proposals in the UK government cut across, impede and diminish what we do, day in and day out, to serve everyone who lives in Scotland. We can't allow that to happen. So, presiding officer, if there are members in this chamber who have influence with the UK government, I'd ask that they use that influence to secure the changes that the Scottish government and the Welsh government seek. If, however, any members believe that the right approach is to support the UK government in such actions, which go directly against 20 years of the settled will of the Scottish people and the effective operation of devolution by all the parties here, then let them say it and be judged accordingly. For presiding officer, I think the vast majority of our constituents would find it astonishing if there were any members elected to this Scottish Parliament who, when faced with such a challenge to the principles of devolution and the powers of the Scottish Parliament, would not put them and the people of Scotland first. Let's therefore hope we can speak as one on these matters. Thank you. There are now uh, for about 40 minutes for questions. I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons. And I call on Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I thank the Minister for advance copy of his statement. And I welcome his acceptance in his words of the progressive, dynamic development and expansion of devolution, which has made a real difference to people's lives, all of which has occurred under both governments led by Labour and Conservatives since 1997. Unsurprisingly, presided officer, Scottish Conservatives challenged the construction placed upon the actions and motives of the UK government now, and the ceaseless hyperbole of a so-called power grab, 
which the UK government has repeatedly and expressly stated is neither desired nor intended. I understand that the Scottish Government seemingly is ever in want of a grievance, but surely not now. So I do welcome the absence of that rhetoric in the statement just delivered. Yeah. The practical issue at hand is a bill to ensure arrangements are in place, not at some distant point, but in the immediate hours after the UK has withdrawn from the EU in March 2019. Whatever our wishes about the outcome of the vote the vast majority of us campaigned for last June, we have a duty to prepare for the UK's departure from the EU. Last week in the government's programme debate, I made clear that Brexit is not politics as normal. If, and this statement in the First Minister's memorandum suggests that it may be, there is a genuine concern matched by an equally genuine resolve to address and overcome this, then Scottish Conservatives here at Holyrood will play our part. The Minister, I believe, challenged this side directly. And in that spirit, I respond by saying that both I and Adam Tompkins stand ready to meet bilaterally with the Deputy First Minister and Mr Russell to explore these concerns further, understand the various remedies and positions, and to work where we can do to do all we feel able to do to secure an LCM the Scottish Government will have confidence for placing before this Parliament. Will the Minister and the Government therefore accept our offer, accepting their offer, I suppose, to move beyond the positioning today and add further process to substantiate the endeavour shared by us all of both securing an orderly exit from the EU, but also a substantial and coherent future additional settlement of responsibilities for this Parliament. Minister. Presiding officer, can I welcome that very warmly and say immediately that of course I commit myself and the Deputy First Minister to meet with yourself and, and Mr Tompkins and to discuss these matters. I think that is a significant step forward that we have heard here today and I'm very grateful for it. Uh, there is a way through uh, on this matter. Uh, it is uh, the Welsh Government and ourselves have worked very hard to consider what the right approach is. Uh, we do not have a monopoly of wisdom and clearly there may be uh, other issues to consider. So uh, absolutely in the spirit of the statement that I have made, I welcome that. I commit myself to have that discussion as early as possible. And let us see if we can speak as one parliament. That would be a major step forward for all of us. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. I thank the Minister for an advanced copy of his statement. And I welcome his willingness to work with all parties across the parliaments and assemblies of the United Kingdom to seek to protect the devolution settlement and to mitigate the impact of Brexit uh, on those we represent. The Minister is right, of course, to say that people of different parties and none campaigned 20 years ago for devolution. But it is also true to say that a Labour government brought those proposals forward and that it did so uh, to bring government closer to the people of all the nations and regions of our United Kingdom and to make our shared democracy stronger. The bill, as it stand, stands, seeks to overturn the basic principle of devolution established by Donald Ewart in the Scotland Act and endorsed by that referendum 20 years ago, namely that what is not reserved is devolved. And Mr Russell has talked about amendments he has discussed and agreed with Labour ministers in Wales. I uh, welcome that work and, uh, and he will be aware, of course, of the amendments which will be proposed by Labour colleagues to address the devolution aspects of the bill at Westminster. If those amendments are passed and the principles of the devolution settlement are protected, can the minister confirm today that a legislative consent uh, motion will then be brought forward by his government. The bill would also take away powers from all our parliaments, including the House of Commons, and place those powers in the hands of ministers. If the bill is amended, does the minister that accept that simply transferring unaccountable powers in devolved areas from UK ministers to Scottish ministers would not be enough, and that therefore work to increase the scrutiny uh, powers of this parliament in relation uh, to those new powers would be all the more essential? Minister. Off to the second point, absolutely, and I indicated in my statement we don't regard these uh, powers to be acceptable. There needs to be a framework of scrutiny, uh, and I indicated we would be uh, more than willing to enter into that discussion. On the, the first point, I certainly think it is significant that last night in the House of Commons, the reasoned amendment which was proposed by Labour, which contained a uh, very substantial reference to the issue of devolution, was backed by SNP members and a range of others. And I think that gives me considerable hope, uh, as my experience of working with the uh, government in Wales, in particular with Professor Mark Drakeford, to whom I, uh, I pay great tribute, has, has become a close colleague over the, the last year. That work together will allow us to centre on what can be achieved. It is sometimes very easy in this chamber uh, to make a great deal of difference, and there are differences, and not least on ultimate destination. But on this matter, 
there is a huge correspondence of interest to get this right. Of working with Labour in uh, this Parliament, working with other colleagues in this Parliament, working with uh, uh, parties across the board in Wales, let us hope with some parties in Northern Ireland, uh, and working in the House of Commons, I hope we can make substantial progress to make sure that the proposals as presently drafted uh, do not go forward. And I do confirm to the member that were the uh, aims that we have set with the Welsh Government, uh, the very clear aims we have set in the amendments were to be achieved, that would create the circumstances in which a legislative consent motion would become possible. But it is not possible presently because they have not made those changes. In fact, they have not made a single change, as, uh, as um, uh, Ken Clark pointed out in the House of Commons last night, referring specifically to devolution. I call on Stuart McMillan to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can the Minister confirm if the Scottish Government was involved in the drafting of any UK Government papers uh, which directly impacted on devolution, such as science or civil justice? And also, would the Minister be prepared to be part of any future UK negotiating team to work to get the best deal for Scotland? Minister. I I'm afraid we have not been involved in the drafting of any of these papers. And uh, uh, as the members will be aware, I, I made that point uh, forcibly in a letter to David Davis last week, uh, which was released to the press. I think it is unacceptable, completely unacceptable, that papers on uh, matters, uh, devolved matters, are being submitted within this process uh, without the courtesy of seeking the involvement of the Scottish Government. These papers are normally shown to our civil servants 24 to 48 hours uh, before they are published, and there is no opportunity uh, to change them or to, to comment on them in any way. They are just uh, essentially delivered. Uh, we want, obviously, to take part in the discussion of what these issues are, and that will become more and more crucial uh, as and when stage two of negotiations starts uh, in, in Brussels. Um, in terms of involvement in the UK structures, uh, Professor Drakeford and I have uh, indicated uh, to the UK government that we think there is a role for the uh, devolved administrations to the JMC process to fit into the monthly cycle of negotiations. We can see a place in which that would work, uh, and we would want to continue to discuss that. Now, it, it is, of course, well known that there has been no uh, JMC uh, since February. I, I think I should probably say today, in case the information has been passed to other people who may wish to use it, that the, an invitation arrived, strangely enough, this very lunchtime. Uh, for a JMC to take place on the 16th of October. And uh, uh, we will be accepting that, uh, so that will only be eight and a half months, uh, no, eight months and one week uh, between JMCs. But we could fit into a monthly cycle. That would be part of the negotiating cycle. And of course, we stand ready to, to give the information on what we think is important to Scotland, in fact, what is crucial to Scotland in these negotiations. Adam Tompkins, to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the uh, Minister's positive response to Jackson Carlaw's uh, question a few moments ago. And like the Minister, I think that a deal can and should be done uh, to enable the withdrawal bill to pass with this Parliament's consent. And in that spirit, may I ask when the Minister thinks he'll be able to share with us in this chamber the sorts of amendments uh, he considers desirable, in particular as regards future UK common frameworks after Brexit? Minister. I'd be very happy to share those amendments once they are finally agreed between ourselves and the Government of Wales. We're very close to that, so if the member will bear with me, I'm happy to provide those as soon as we possibly can and to start to discuss uh, how they might move forward. Uh, and if uh, I'm sure the member has some substantial influence with his colleagues south of the border, if he were to use that influence to promote these amendments, uh, we would find that very useful too. So we undertake to make sure the amendments are made known. And if there are views from uh, a, a, a Mr. Tompkins and uh, others on how these amendments can be improved, we're happy to listen to them and we will arrange to meet to discuss it. Daniel Johnson to be followed by Ross Greer. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the great strengths of the Scotland Act is its simplicity. Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act sets out very clearly which powers are reserved, with the presumption being that all others are devolved. The withdrawal bill does not directly amend the Scotland Act, and this means that the conflict may not just be one of principle, but one of law. Does the Scottish Government consider that this may be the case? Has it taken legal advice on the status that the bill might take? And would it consider legal challenge to the withdrawal bill if it proceeds unamended? Minister. Thank you for that question. Of course, it is uh, not uh, appropriate for ministers to uh, say whether or not they have taken legal advice. Uh, but uh, clearly, uh, we consider these matters uh, in every possible way, including obviously looking at them from the standpoint of the law. 
Equally, it would be very foolish for me to say at any stage that we had either ruled in or ruled out legal action, except to say that uh, I believe these matters that we're discussing today are matters of politics, uh, and it is a political approach which I outlined, for example, in my statement, that I think is defective, and if the political approach was to change, that there was an acceptance, as the member says, of the, the basic simplicity of the devolved settlement, that those things are not, that are not reserved are devolved, then that would produce a political solution to these matters, and I'm looking for that political political solution to these matters. Ross Beard, to be followed by Tavish Scott. Ross Beard. Thank you. The repeal bill is a power grab, not simply for the UK Parliament, but for the UK government over the people of these islands and their elected representatives. The Greens will certainly not be supporting legislative consent for this bill, but we believe the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government must hold ourselves to a higher standard. So can I ask the Minister, if the repeal bill is not adequately amended at Westminster, will the Scottish Government commit to appropriately and democratically restricting the powers it will be given, and to do so where possible with the collective agreement of this Parliament? Minister. Yes, I will. Of course, I'll make that commitment. Uh, this is a matter of concern to all of us. Uh, you know, m even ministers do not wish to exercise or should not wish to exercise untrammeled power of that nature. So I think it is important that we ensure that there are, uh, there's the proper scrutiny and the proper restriction in place. I am, uh, I am hopeful that we will secure the amendments we wish to seek. And it's quite important to understand the, the nature of amendments. There, uh, there will be a group of amendments, I hope, and I'm, I'm given additional hope this afternoon by the approach of the Conservative front bench. There are a group of amendments which will be agreed between ourselves and, and the Welsh Government, and I hope cross-party in Wales, uh, which would form a core which might attract support across the House of Commons, and that would be very helpful. Uh, there will, of course, be a range of other amendments that uh, parties will take forward. Uh, uh, the procedures of the House of Commons are arcane and strange to those of us who work in a modern parliament, but I understand last night there was an unseemly rush at the uh, end of, uh, of the second stage of the bill to um, ensure that the amendments were put on the table. People jostled each other in order to get them there because it is the order of those amendments that in some way determines how they should be taken. We will, in a calm, professional and modern way, take forward our amendments, presumably until they get to the House of Commons, in which they will be treated just like anything else. But I would hope that those amendments would attract support across the parties. And indeed, if the, if the, if the Conservatives are able to uh, persuade their colleagues uh, elsewhere, then perhaps there will be a unanimity of view, which would be very helpful. But I, I make the commitment to the member, uh, we have no desire to exercise these powers uh, without proper scrutiny. And we will, of course, work right across the chamber and with the committees to make sure that there is that proper scrutiny. And, of course, that is a major issue for the Westminster Bill as well. Tavish Scott to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Tavish Thank Scott. You. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, we, will, we on these benches will certainly work with uh, Mr Russell and his government on strengthening, not weakening, devolution. Uh, and, but I hope he uh, and this parliament would expect a guarantee from the UK government that everything that is devolved remains devolved. And that is the way in which the amendments that are planned need to be achieved, including, of course, the frameworks uh, which should be agreed rightly across all uh, governments. Mr Russell said in his remarks that the process of Brexit was a cover for taking powers. Might he accept that that assumes a constitutional conspiracy within the United Kingdom government, which I don't believe is the reality. This is a UK government that cannot sort itself out on its Brexit negotiating position, uh, never mind work out what its position is in relation to Cardiff, Belfast or Edinburgh. So in that context, uh, how does he plan to make sure these amendments pass uh, and will he ensure that that guarantee that I believe this parliament should have is provided for without any further delay? Minister. I'm going to remember, I, I'm, I'm trying to be in a generous and conciliatory mood, so I'm not going to take the, the, the temptation that he gives me to attack the UK government for its lack of organisation. I will let that speak for itself. Um, the reality of the situation is that we will clearly want to ensure that when those amendments are discussed amongst the parties, that there is an agreement to, uh, who will vote for them. And therefore, to that extent, I, I suppose I put the question back to the member. I hope his colleagues at Westminster will support them uh, in both houses, should they require to go to a uh, a second house, and I hope that all the parties will feel similar. There is an interest in supporting them. Uh, the SNP is certainly in that position. We do not nominate members of the House of Lords, so if it comes to the House of Lords, we will require other people to support, but there will be, of course, interest we know from Labour, from Liberals, from Green MP, uh, and uh, I hope perhaps increasingly even from the Conservative government itself that would guarantee that they passed. 
Christina McKelvey to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Christina Thank you very McKelvey. much, President Officer. Given the EU withdrawal bill makes little provision for EU nationals, does the Scottish Government agree with me that the UK Government's plans to create a national register of EU nationals is divisive, alienating and deeply, deeply disturbing? And instead of taking 111 devolved powers away from this place, the UK Government should be devolving immigration powers to this place to allow us to at least treat our EU nationals in this nation with some respect. Minister. I, I do very much agree with the member. I, I should pay tribute to the member uh, I was speaking to, um, Lord Dubbs, at the weekend, uh, of course, who has played such a crucial role in the issue of refugee children. And he paid tribute uh, to a number of people who have been involved with him in Scotland, including, I have to say, uh, Christina McKelvey. And I'm, uh, he was grateful to her, as he was grateful to the Scottish Government for the work that's being done. And he is an inspirational figure, and he, we should all learn from him. I think the issue in here of, of EU nationals particularly is very troubling. There was some sign of progress in the paper that came from the UK government that there was an intention to try and get a settlement with the EU on the issue of EU nationals. There was some evidence of growing together. That has been put into reverse by the leak of the Home Office paper. Whether that leak was deliberate or accidental, it is very difficult to reconcile the progress that appeared to be being made on the issue of EU nationals within the negotiations with a paper that would be utterly unacceptable to the vast majority of us. So I do think the UK government needs to clarify what its position is. If its position is to try and get an agreement with the EU on the basis of the papers being exchanged, then they're not there yet, but progress is being made. If the position is to take the Home Office paper and to use that as a basis for an immigration policy, then it would be utterly unacceptable. I certainly do agree with the member that a devolved migration policy is more needed than ever, and I'm very uh, heartened by the approach of a whole range of organizations, uh, uh, business and other organizations who've moved to that position to do. The Chambers of Commerce, for example, have, have made that point, as has the STUC. Uh, a devolved uh, uh, migration policy applies in other places, applies in Canada, applies in parts of Australia, uh, and it would be a solution that would allow us to address our own particular problems, including the problem of depopulation. Uh, in my own constituency, we have a substantial problem of depopulation, which can only be resolved by attracting people into the area. That is why many of us have been so pleased that they, we've taken in our girl more Syrian migrants than anywhere else. A, a, a proper migration policy for Scotland, devolved to Scotland, uh, would be something of great importance. And I do hope the UK government will find its way towards that. Regrettably, the Prime Minister is a former Home Secretary who has a, a narrow view of migration. I think we should take a much more generous view of migration. Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, despite some thinking that this is all about attacking the principles of devolution, the EU withdrawal bill means laws and rules will continue to apply. The truth is the EU withdrawal bill follows the spirit of devolution and the laws created the Scottish Parliament 20 years ago. It keeps the current position to provide certainty for individuals and for businesses while we discuss, discuss future arrangements. Does the Minister believe that the Scottish Government should provide as much certainty and continuity as possible for people and businesses across Scotland as we leave the EU? Minister. Uh, I do believe we should provide as much certainty as possible, but with the greatest respect to Member, it, it is not the Scottish Government that is creating the uncertainty, it is the UK Government. I don't want to fall out with the Member here. I think uh, we've heard from the people alongside her on the members groan. They expect me to fall out with people, and I'm trying very hard not to. Uh, we've heard from the people on the front bench alongside her a, a positive step forward and a positive move forward, and I hope she would endorse that, and I hope she would recognise that we have uh, clearly a genuine difference as to whether the EU withdrawal bill uh, respects the principles of devolution. I think if you were to read it in its entirety, you could not but conclude that it did not respect the principles of devolution. But let us agree to differ on that. And let us see if we can find some way forward to try and get progress on this matter, which uh, has been the position of those on the front bench alongside her, and I hope will now be her position as well. Polly McNeill to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Polly McNeill. Presiding officer, we will, of course, on this side of the House, seek to protect the principles of the devolution settlement that what is not reserved is devolved. That is the spirit of the devolution settlement, which is being, frankly, undermined by the EU withdrawal bill as it currently stands. I'd like to ask the Minister, given in his opening statement, he said that should there be progress, and let's hope that there is, and this Parliament gets to the stage where it has some scrutiny uh, job to do over it, 
You talked about the code decision procedure currently used by the EU, which is an interesting framework for the UK and the devolved nations. How much detail has gone into that thinking and has there been any direct discussions with the UK government and whether they would sign up to such a framework? Minister. It's been difficult to have detailed discussions with the UK government because they've not really given the opportunity for those detailed discussions. But I indicated my considerable interest in the paper that the Welsh government published, and they have thought you know, through a lot of these issues. Our position is that we want to see the ref as closely as possible the replication of those structures of co-decision making, and the word is really important. I'm glad the member has used, used it. There will be a number of different ways in which that can happen. The Welsh paper, for example, looks at what you would call qualified majority voting, and, and I think there are some issues in there. My discussions with UK ministers in this have tended to be brief because UK ministers have usually said they cannot imagine circumstances in which any Westminster department would agree to co-decision making. Well, they have to imagine that. If, in actual fact, we're going to make this work, then, for example, a shared framework on agriculture, which appears to be one of the areas that the UK government wishes to have a shared framework, though we have no confirmation of that, uh, which worked on the principle of co-decision making amongst the countries, would be a step forward. Because then we would have a genuine ability to influence decisions and to be part of decisions. But a structure that simply said, as, as the JMC tends to, to be, that all meetings are held in London, they're always chaired by a UK minister, uh, the agenda is always set, and there are no votes, uh, it's not going to be a, a framework we could agree to. So there's progress being made in the sense that the Welsh have been thinking, we've been thinking too and supporting some of their thoughts. We want the UK government to engage in that. It is unfortunate that Northern Ireland does not presently have a government and a, and a parliament. We hope that when that is restored, and it will be, we hope it will be restored, then that will add to that thinking. And of course, in Northern Ireland, they do have experience of being able to bring together decision-making in circumstances where there is considerable disagreement and polarization. So I'm hopeful we could do this, but it will have to be on the basis of something new, not simply on repeating what already exists at, at Westminster. Bruce Crawford, before by Mary Goujon. Bruce Crawford. President Officer, I'm glad the Minister has taken the opportunity to make this statement to Parliament today and the spirit in which the questions have both been put and answered. Uh, from a wider perspective, does the Minister agree that item three in the terms of reference of the Joint Ministerial Committee, EN, states provide oversight of negotiations with the EU to ensure, as far as possible, that outcomes are agreed by all four governments are secured from these negotiations? Can the Minister confirm there has been an opportunity to be so involved? What input opportunities have been provided to the Scottish Government? And does he think the UK Government has provided the appropriate level of respect, both to the Scottish Government and to this Parliament, in this regard? Minister. Well, alas, I cannot confirm that that has been the case. I, I wish it had been. Uh, the, I, the two principal uh, in uh, terms of reference of JMCEN, whereas, as the member says, oversight and negotiations were preceded by uh, uh, seeking to agree the Article 50 letter. Uh, we did not see the Article 50 letter uh, in, in any form. Uh, I think the meeting stopped in February because I think it was a fear that they would have to show us the Article 50 letter. So that did not happen. But, you know, I remain always hopeful that things will change and get better, and it is, uh, I hope, an opportunity now to move to that process of oversight. Now, the committee has not met since the 8th of February, so clearly we have not been able to have any oversight of the first three rounds of negotiation. Uh, there has been, and I, I know I'm, I make this clear, and I know Mark Drakeford will make this clear too, there has been in each round uh, an opportunity to talk to uh, David Davis about what is taking place, and one round somewhat after the round, and the second round during the round, third round after the round. But those aren't consultations. Those aren't discussions of what issues are coming up or positions. They are, in actual fact, uh, Mr. Davis saying what has happened and putting his own particular, um, I suppose the word must be spin, on what has happened. Um, we need a proper chance to discuss in advance. We know what the issues will be. We know what the process of negotiation is. We know what each round will consist of. That would focus the discussion in that monthly cycle and allow to come to the table the position we've taken. And you know, the UK government might be presently surprised on some occasions that you know, we have a, a correspondence of position. We don't have on the issue of EU nationals, and we publish separately on that. But you know, there's always the possibility that we'll find areas in which our insights are useful and helpful. Um, you know, for example, in the Article 50 letter, I suspect Mark Drake and I might have noticed that Gibraltar wasn't mentioned and said, you know, why don't you do something about it? So we stand ready to get involved in that, but so far it hasn't happened. Marie Goujon to be followed by Donald Cameron. Marie Goujon. 
Should the UK government not take uh, cognizance of the concerns raised by the Scottish and Welsh governments, uh, can I ask the Minister if he has received any assurances that UK-wide frameworks in certain areas will not be imposed by Westminster? Minister. Uh, no, I haven't received those assurances. I mean, quite clearly, were we not able to um, consent to the bill, the proper procedure would be that the UK government would withdraw the items, uh, the, 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 the areas of the bill uh, in question. We have no indication that that would happen. Um, this, we are in uncharted waters, as we seem to have been all the time for the, the last 12 months, uh, and we would wait and see what happens. So we've had no such assurances uh, about anything of that nature. I would have hoped that the opportunity that exists now uh, over the next few weeks to get this right uh, would mean that we wouldn't get to that stage. Uh, but now, you know, the clock is ticking on this, so we do need, need to know from the UK government what they intend to do. And the discussion uh, we would hope to have with the uh, Conservative Party in this Parliament, I hope, would be part of that. Donald Cameron to be followed by Richard Lockett. Donald Cameron. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the spirit of cross-party working emerging between my party and his in the last hour, will the Minister undertake to share his draft amendments with my party's front bench in private before they are published? Minister. Uh, Mr Cameron appears to be something of a rush on this, I have to say. I, uh, I, I'm quite willing to do so, uh, but I'd want to make sure that my colleagues in Wales were content with that process. But I, I would want to take this forward as speedily as we can and with as much uh, confidence and trust in each other as we can uh, and with the ability to talk about these things in a way that isn't necessarily going to send us all uh, running to, to the newspapers. So um, I have to say um, I have uh, considerable time for Donald Cameron. We, we spend time together in our guile on a variety of things and I think the point he makes is one I understand. Let's see if we can build the trust in that uh, that would allow such things to happen. Richard Lockhead to be followed by James Kelly. Richard Lockhead. Can I welcome the Minister's statement and his commitment to stand up for this Parliament uh, and Scotland's interests? In terms of funding, does he agree that Scotland potentially faces a triple whammy as a result of the UK's approach to Brexit? Firstly, is the fact we're leaving the EU, which means we'll lose EU funding. Secondly, it seems increasingly likely we're going to have to pay Scottish taxpayers' money towards compensating the EU for leaving. And thirdly, if the UK government grab responsibility for a number of key sectors in Scotland, and given their different spending priorities, these key sectors will lose out in funding in the future post-Brexit as well in Scotland. Does he therefore agree we face a real possibility of that triple whammy? Minister. I do agree. I think that the financial issues of, of withdrawal are, have not been uh, properly uh, explored as yet by the UK government, and they are many and varied. Uh, there are essentially three areas uh, which uh, are major areas for withdrawal. One is workforce. And I think increasingly companies are beginning to realise and public bodies begin to realise uh, the crippling effect uh, that the, the, the lack of EU migra migrants will have, uh, often because they just don't want to stay given the circumstances that, that they now face. The second one is regulation, where there is a cat's cradle of re regulation, which is vital and important. If you look at, for example, food standards, uh, over 90% of food standards regulation in Scotland is EU regulation, and there are huge issues there. And the third one is money. And it's one of the most difficult to bottom out because it ranges from, as Mr. Lockhead knows, given his vast experience in agriculture, the levels of support for agriculture, also the rural development support, but then it goes to a range of other things, infrastructure funding. Then if one looks, for example, at education, the college sector, uh, support for additional college places, and so it goes on. So there are very serious financial issues that need to be addressed in a very short time. Because although there are guarantees given to 2020, uh, there, that is a short period of time. And those guarantees also do not exist in absolute beyond 2020. So uh, there, is, there are severe financial problems facing a whole range of organizations. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we have to make sure that we understand this and we've got the frameworks in place to cope with them. Although I have to say, uh, and I'm not trying to, to be divisive, I have to say there are some issues in this that cannot be coped with. Uh, it, it, it will be impossible for some organization, for example, to find labor, which simply will not exist for the works that they do. 60% of the abattoir sector comes from the rest of the EU. 95% of the veterinary staff in abattoirs come from the rest of the EU. Uh, it would not be possible to replicate or replace that. And it is very important to realize that. It couldn't be done in a year or five years. 
It's a generational issue, if at all possible. Uh, and that is a reality we're facing. And that is why the only sensible step at the present moment is to ensure continued membership of the single market and continued membership of the customs union. Because if you are able to guarantee the, the continuity uh, 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 of the four freedoms, you have a chance of coping with this. Otherwise, you don't. James Kelly to be followed by Ash Denham. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is clearly a difficult political situation. And obviously, there is support in Parliament for the Minister taking forward appropriate discussions with other parties, the devolved administration in Wales and the UK government. Can I ask the Minister how you will keep uh, Parliament updated on the progress of these discussions? Minister. I'm very happy to do so. I've, um, I seem to be a regular at many of the committees, or certain of the committees in the Parliament, and I'm happy to continue to do that. I'm happy to continue to make statements. I'm, of course, open to question uh, in this chamber. Um, I think in two sets of questions that it's possible to do so. But I'm also very happy to have discussions with individual members. I've made it clear from the very beginning that I'm happy to talk to members about particular concerns they have uh, and to share information with them. So at each level, I will be happy to do so. And I, I do very much uh, echo what Mr. Kelly has said, that the, the potential for us working together to resolve this is the important thing. And therefore, there will be perhaps unusual ways of doing this that we haven't done before, but we do have to keep a close contact on this between all the parties. Ash Denham to be followed by Jimmy Halcro Johnson. Ash Denham. The Brexit negotiations have shown that we need a radical shift in how intergovernmental relations are managed between the UK and the devolved nations. What does the Minister see as the best way forward in this? Minister. Uh, Professor Drakeford and I uh, uh, authored a, a letter together in June. Uh, to David Davis that laid out proposals for the Joint Ministerial Committee on European Negotiations, accepting that the experience had not been satisfactory for any of, of the partners. And anybody who has been as a minister at the JMC will know it's not a, a deeply enriching experience. The whole JMC structure has not worked for a long time, and indeed all the academic study and, and parliamentary study of the JMC has drawn attention to the fact that it's n it can't really bear the weight that's put upon it. Um, unfortunately, we've had no response to those uh, suggestions, but there are positive, constructive suggestions coming from Wales and from, uh, uh, and from Scotland on this, and it wouldn't take very much to try and get that working properly. I, I've mentioned in response to a question earlier about co-decision making. The JMC does not operate on anything like a basis of co-decision making. That's one way that we could move. The JMC has only once met outside London which was in Cardiff at the end of January this year. And even that was run by the UK government. It is always chaired by a UK minister. The balance between the delegations is always pretty astounding. Even JMC EN, um, without the Northern Irish, has, has meant that uh, Professor Drakeford and myself usually sit facing eight or 10 UK ministers. The balance can even be even more dramatic as, uh, as Alistair Allen knows when you get to the JMC Europe, where there can be 10, 15, on one occasion I was present, 20 UK ministers, and only myself and Rodri Morgan, so that wasn't really an equity of ours. So there are ways that we can reform the JMC structure, but there has to be a willingness to talk, and you also cannot create a new multilateral structure by bilateral negotiation. So the, the way in which things have been going at the present moment, there's simply been bilateral negotiation between the UK government and the devolved administrations, needs to develop into a multilateral discussion. At least we have today uh, an indication of a meeting of the JMC. So it's a small move forward, but it needs to get a move on. Jimmy Halcro Johnson to be followed by a final question from Ivan McKee. Jimmy Halcro Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, despite the Minister's objections to the process of leaving, can we be assured that the Scottish Government is planning seriously for a future outside of the EU? And with the UK government stating that we'll be outside of the customs union, can the minister confirm that work to internationalise Scottish business will focus beyond the EU market, where new innovation and investment hubs seem to be targeted currently? Um, I, I don't think the member is fully conversant with the difficulties of being outside the customs union. Uh, and I think also perhaps he has swallowed uh, too willingly uh, the explanations from Liam Fox about this wonderful new world that exists out there. There is no evidence of any description that in actual fact uh, the internationalization uh, of business will answer these questions, partly because business is already internationalized. The, um, the, the most successful country in Europe in terms of internationalizing business is Germany, and Germany is at the very heart of the European Union. So I would just caution the member uh, to believe the spin that, that has come from, uh, from Liam Fox. 
uh, our belief is that continued membership of the customs union in the single market is the sensible way forward. We published that um, as last December, before the member was in this chamber. Uh, we continue to believe it is the right thing to do, and there are many who have come to that opinion. So we will continue to push that forward uh, as the solution. Of course, businesses and others talk to us all the time about what is lying ahead. But many of them look at this with complete trepidation, as I've indicated. If you are involved in issues of the workforce, in issues of funding, in issues of regulation, there are no simple answers. And simply to blithely talk about the internationalization of business perhaps shows that the member does not yet understand that. And Ivan McKee. Okay, can I thank the Minister for his statement and for the work he's doing standing up for Scotland on this important issue. Can the Minister provide an update on joint working between the Scottish and Welsh governments on this matter? Minister. Yes, uh, we meet regularly with uh, representatives of the Welsh Government. I was with uh, Professor Drakeford yesterday, who, was, who attended the, our Standing Council. I attended their Standing Council in May. Um, we, continue, we have met uh, with other ministers present, the Lord Advocate and the Welsh Law Officer met along with myself and, and Professor Drakeford in uh, July, uh, and we have regular discussions between civil servants, and we have developed, as I said in my statement, the Welsh Legislative Consent Memorandum is published today alongside ours, uh, and they're very similar, although there's slightly different processes, and we're bringing forward amendments. So there continues to be a, 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 an identity of interest in this, and that's what it's based upon, an identity of interest. We both believe this is the wrong thing to happen. Now, I am, presiding officer, heartened by what I've heard in this chamber today. I think we have moved a step forward. Uh, it, it, is, it may well go into reverse, but I hope it doesn't, and I make the commitment to meet with those people who have asked for those discussions to take it forward. Uh, and uh, if the same thing is happening in Wales, and I hope it is happening in Wales, then perhaps uh, we have some opportunities we didn't know existed uh, as little as an hour and a half ago. Thank you, Minister, and thank all members for their contributions. We're now, that completes our statement. We're going to move on to a statement from Fergus Ewing on Common Agricultural Policy, but we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.